Hello, welcome to the Redemptorist Missio Studios at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Częstochowa in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. My name is Evelyn Walsh, and I am the director of the Rachel's Vineyard Retreats here at the Shrine. Our program today is called Touched by Many, Moved by Love. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Teresa Burke, the founder of Rachel's Vineyard, and our special guest, Julianne. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, the show is Touched by Mercy, Moved by Love. And today we have a beautiful example of God's mercy with Julianne, who's here to share the story of uh, her abortion experiences and the healing that she's found in Rachel's Vineyard and some of the challenges that continue in, um, because you have, you have quite a story. We're eager to unpack that with you. Mm -hmm. Can't thank you enough for being uh, with us today to okay. share about a topic that happens all over the world mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the millions and millions, but very few people speak of, yeah. probably because of the grieving and the shame and... Um, why don't you go back for us and share some of the things that, that if we could go back to your childhood, it'd be sure, probably helpful sure. because sometimes I think you can be set up and be made vulnerable by things that happen in the past because it's not just a one incident event, it's kind of an abortion experience and decision can be a accumulation of mm -hmm. many different events that have been painful and make you feel that you wouldn't be able to handle motherhood for some reason. Sure. Um, I think for me, I mean, there was nothing special about our family. We were an um, Irish Catholic family. I'm one of seven, third oldest of seven, raised in a small town here in Pennsylvania. Uh, all of us attended Catholic school, which I think, you know, even back when I think back that far, it can be really difficult uh, when you do, when you're, when you're different. And, and attending Catholic school back then, we're talking 70s, 80s, was, was different. Uh, even on the school bus, you're made fun of and you're shamed for your Catholic faith or your uniform or the way you look or just because you're different. It was just a lot of shaming, and for some reason that really impacted me um, specifically, and I just uh, just developed a really low sense of self-esteem. I never felt confident. I never felt good enough. Uh, even through school, high school, I really struggled uh, to feel like I belonged. I always felt different. Of course, I was redheaded, which was <laughs> just already set me up for being different, and I, and I did. I just really felt different. I didn't feel... Um, I, special. I didn't feel like I stood out. Uh, we had a very um, conservative, strict, if you will, Catholic upbringing. Our parents were very strict, uh, both of them from large Catholic families. My dad was one of 16. My mother was one of 10. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it goes, uh, you know, it goes pretty, um, you know, pretty, pretty deep in, in the Catholic faith. And uh, I mean, they, they did what they could. They just, they were very busy. It just wasn't a real, you know, growing up. They are now very, you know, we, we, we come across different versions of even our parents as, as we get older too. Um, but, but it was, it was just very functional, um, living, functional Catholic. You, it was more about God's um, judgment and, and things like that. So you, you know, your impure thoughts even and, and things like that just were, you know, the hammer of God, so to speak. So you really learn to fear God you know, in, in that environment. So uh, I think it was, I was a junior in high school and I had to attend Catholic school or private school I'm sorry, public school, from private school uh, due to some family dynamics and, and economic issues. And I met um, my, my very first boyfriend there and just started to get attention. And, you know, at that point, it just it felt really good to get that kind of attention and the pressure uh, to become sexually active at that point was really great. I ended up... Um, my very first sexual experience, I uh, sustained a, an injury that put me in the hospital. So there was, it was obvious I was becoming sexually active to my parents and there was a lot of uh, shame and uh, involved in that. Um, but I was ultimately allowed to see the young man again and we ended up getting pregnant in 2000, or not 2000, in 1985, we got pregnant. So at 17, I was sent back to Catholic school and, uh, and where I was pregnant for most of my senior year. So again, a lot of shame, a lot of uh, feelings of not being good enough, not being able to join my classmates. I wasn't even allowed to graduate with the class at that point. I, you know, I had my diploma and, and I just, um, 
exited quietly stage laughter, <laughs> however you put it. And then actually that was a Friday night I was supposed to graduate and the following day I got married. I married the father. Uh, so I was, you know, just had turned 18 at that point. Uh, gave birth to my daughter, Heather, uh, two months later. So uh, a lot of shame there, uh, just involved in, in that whole experience. I let my family down. I let my brothers and sisters were embarrassed and, and just, you know, that really set the stage um, for, for just a lot of shame and just for that element to enter, enter my life, so. Um, what happened after that? After that, the, the marriage obviously, you know, was, was doomed, if you will, and you know, we were together, we were apart, separated and together, and uh, I think it was in 19, 1989, I left him, and of course Heather was just a few years old, and took a job close to Baltimore and um, near Baltimore, and my daughter was with me. But on uh, weekends when her father would have her, I would I got in with a group and just really started partying and uh, drinking a lot and going out and just hooking up with random folks and um, just the it was the grace of God that I exited that part of my life uh, healthy and uh, not, you know, just I put myself in such vulnerable situations. Like it's almost like I wanted something to happen, you know, to myself. I wanted something to happen that could just. Do you mean you were taking risks? Yes, very risky. So that something would happen to hurt you? Yes. Or yeah. 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 How do you understand that at the time or, or now looking back? How do you understand that? Um, just very, un I was very unhealthy. Just. Um, did not think a lot of myself. Um, you know, I had uh, caused a lot of shame, brought a lot of shame to my family, to myself. My friends seemingly were moving forward with their lives. I had a child, and again, these are my these were my actions that caused it. But as a teenager, it's hard to look at it that way. You feel very much like a victim of something, and and I acted out, and I acted, um, I acted, I acted horribly. And it was during that time that I did actually start seeing um, a young man. Um, I, but again, it was built on just partying and whatnot and became pregnant uh, at 21. And that's when, as soon as I found out I was pregnant, he, uh, he, the relationship ended and um, I made the decision through support, if you will, of some girls that I was hanging out with to have an abortion. Julianne, you, you said that as soon as he found out, the relationship ended. Mm -hmm. How did that transpire? He wasn't willing to be a father? or you No, he just didn't take my calls. And okay. um, after the abortion, I even, I, I went right back to it. I was just... I went right back to the partying and I sought him out at the same places and even went to his home and he just told me he didn't care because I told him what I had done and he didn't care and there was already a, you know another person in his life at that point. So were you aware of grief following that event or were you just re-entering the party scene? I just I act, I put it away. I compartmentalized it. Um, so it really wasn't something that preoccupied much of your time, but you kept yourself pretty busy. And would you say that work kept you busy too? Would you? Work kept me busy for a time, but very quickly, I, uh, for the only time in my life, uh, I was actually let go because of my lifestyle. Yeah. I was showing up to work um, hungover, uh, and it just got worse after, you know, after the after the abortion, but even then it seemed like something about me had changed and people weren't interested in being around me anymore. It wasn't as much fun. Ah, so okay, because you had that. Yeah, yeah. So I packed up and moved back to my parents' house uh, with my tail between my legs and of course intent that they would never know, you know, what I had done uh, and started, uh, you know, looking for a job back home and um, Shortly thereafter, I went back to uh, my daughter's father. Uh, we weren't divorced at that point. We were just separated. And we qu very quickly got pregnant with my daughter, with, a, with another daughter. And I was not happy. I was just, uh, I, you know, I was not happy. Um, but we kept, obviously, you know, we were together. We, we um, Megan, Megan is now 29 um, and has a little grandchild, I have a little grandson and a, another one on the way with Megan. Um, and we were together for about three years and then I, I left finally. We did file for a divorce, you know, so we were married exactly 10 years. And um, 
After that, I continued when I didn't have my girls. I continued to party. I uh, continued to fall in with groups. It was at that point I started working for a mental health, mental retardation uh, company and met a lot of mental health professionals. But in that circle, there was also a lot of um, homosexuality. It was accepted. It was actually um, very much accepted and new age and I love everybody. And I really kind of fell into that a little bit uh, before I met my second husband. And um, Boy, you were really taking quite a journey through the woods, up the mountains, <laughs> down I again. <laughs> it sounds like it was kind of tumultuous time. Very much so. You mentioned being um, a teen mom at 17, mm -hmm. and then having the experience of abortion, and then another yeah. child. Did, do you feel that in the shame of the first, that the life of your baby was able to be celebrated by your family? My first, yeah, my, first. my daughter. I, I do. Um, in fact, I know my mother was concerned when I did get pregnant at 17. She actually had my sisters watching me to make sure I didn't do anything to end the pregnancy. I remember, so she I remember she that vividly. She would have been affirming of life, but, oh, absolutely. but at the same time didn't like the circumstances right, of, of life. Right. Yeah. And then when you, when you went on to experience the loss of your child through abortion, um, a lot of people out there think, it's terrible to give birth to a baby that you have to place for adoption or that you don't want at the time or that you have other plans. But if you were to compare those two experiences, what are your thoughts and reflections on that of the loss? And obviously there were a lot of tumultu tumultuous times. Yeah. And, um, but your general feeling about the kids, it's my understanding from what you had written that you really were attached to them, but at the same time acting out. Yes. Yes. Um, and again, the, the abortion, I just, I tried not to think about. Um, and it, it came back to haunt me much later in life. But I just, um, you know, I had, I had um, my daughter, you know, she's been with me since I was 17. We were very, very close. You know, we spent a lot of time together. We remain close. You know, things aren't always perfect. But, um, but I had that bond with her. I knew I could have it. It was just, I was not going to cause that kind of shame again. I, 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 and I honestly, I remember thinking, how could you let this happen again? Like, how could you do this? And, and I felt shame in that of, of who I was and my inability to, um, to just behave in such a way that wouldn't result in a, in a pregnancy or, you know, at that time. Um, but I didn't feel like I could go back to my parents and say, you know, guess what? <laughs> I'm pregnant again because I just, uh, I, I, we didn't want to bring that shame to myself. I mean, it was very selfish. It's a very selfish decision to make. I think that um, when you speak about the vulnerabilities of shame and shame being so much a part of your life that the shame almost feels normal. And you said that I acted out, but you acted out in a way that would keep doing the shame. And in, um, in psychology, we call this a trauma reenactment. And to not know that your life was more valuable than the shame that you felt yeah. to know that that you belonged to somebody, yeah. God as his child, his beloved, yeah. and that there was mercy for you. You said that down the road, it really came back to haunt me later because you were able to push it aside. What are some of the things that sort of woke you up in terms of wanting, uh, wanting to make some changes? Sure, sure. Well, um, when I was 29, I did, um, I became involved with a, another man who I then proceeded to marry um, for about 20 years. We just recently divorced in 2019. Uh, and again, with him, it was just um, very much a, a, an, an immoral kind of attraction, if you will, at first. Um, and it's actually throughout the entire relationship, it really was. But you didn't, I didn't see it that way. I just thought we had a, a passion for each other. Um, but um, became pregnant again in, um, to, uh, I, can't, I can't recall what year it would have been at this point, but became pregnant um, with, this, with my, the second child. And, I, and again, at those same thoughts, I'm not married. Um, this is going to bring shame, and and frankly, I'm in this relationship, this incredible, incredibly passionate relationship. I don't want this to end, and made the decision again to to have a, an abortion at that point. Um, I don't think I really thought about again. I compartmentalized. Uh, the relationship was not healthy. 
it was not healthy from the very beginning. It was abusive. It was um, very passionate, full of jealousy, and on both parts, actually. Uh, it was really odd. Um, it was just a control factor. And then we ended up getting married and uh, having two children and being married for, for several years. But I think when I started waking up was, I, I was around 2006, 15, 16, honestly, where I just, I was tired. I mean, I had um, been married to this person. We, I moved back uh, home with him to make him happy. We were living in another state at the time that I, I loved. And uh, when I left there, I left my daughter. She was 18 and she refused to come back with us. She wanted to stay where we were in, in Virginia. And uh, she had a boyfriend there and she was going to college and things like that. So that tore uh, me to the core. I experienced probably a, a year worth of just depression because the dynamics of my family had changed. She'd been with me since I was 17. Um, and I came to find out recently she experienced the same kind of depression that I did because it was just such a, a change for us. Um, but I would say um, there was an infidelity on his part. Um, in two, it was around 2007, and that was really when I, I would say I would started awakening. But just, I had a three-year-old and I had a six-year-old, and I had just started a new job, and I just felt trapped. Uh, had, and then I felt stupid that I had allowed myself to become trapped in that kind of relationship and in that position where I couldn't leave, and it just really. Um, suffered along for several years and around 2015 I, I don't I can't put it, my finger on any particular event it was just I remember seeing uh, his father with his stepmother and thinking oh my god that's my future that's what I'm gonna look like and feel like if I continue to stay married to this man and in 2016 we put our marital home up for sale and we just uh, kind of limped along into the following year and 2017 was formidable in so many ways uh, for me um, I I was a, I managed healthcare pra medical practices and I was always the the manager who was surgery and specialty and things like that never imagined myself ever working in the women's service line and I think I avoided it frankly um, and, and in the middle of 2017, I was asked to, uh, I was removed from the practice I was in due to a personality conflict with a doctor. And I was asked to, to, to uh, consider uh, another practice that was high risk pregnancies. And they had been through six managers in six years. And, and, and I was seen as a strong manager and you, you could really, I really excelled at work, which I learned later through counseling that when you're out of control at home, women tend to excel at work which made sense to me. Um, and nobody at work knew about my situation. They, nobody knew what I was going through at home and the verbal abuse, the emotional abuse, the you're not good enough, you're this, you're that, you know, you, you know, just the constant put downs. And you just continued that pattern that was so familiar to you. Yeah. And I deserved it. I thought I deserved it. I, I was paying penance and, and I would always go back to the phrase, and I don't know if I'll say it right, you know, how many times should you forgive? And it's 70 times seven. So, I, you know, okay, am I there yet? <laughs> um, but, you know, there was never any change of behavior. We had been through eight or 10 uh, marital counselors. It just, it, it's who that person is, uh, who he chooses to be. So, and I was choosing to be who I was, and I wasn't happy with that anymore. And that year, uh, so I, I started managing this practice and it was really hard. And this was in June of 2017. This is, I think, right around the time Evelyn, uh, I finally reached out. Um, and Evelyn, I think the year before uh, I had reached out, I was looking for a place far away from where I lived because I wanted to make sure nobody knew me when I went there. Again, there's that shame and I don't, I don't want anybody to know I'm doing this. Uh, this is for me and me only. And, um, in, in 2017, that summer, I started to reach out and Evelyn, you know, we had some conversations and, and I would make excuses, oh, I can't afford it. Well, it's not gonna cost you anything. <laughs> <laughs> and she really just stayed, stayed with me. I would say that summer I was experiencing a lot of different things with work and instability and, and, then, um, and then that. But uh, I was asking God, like, why? Why, did, why women's health? It, it's hard to be here. You know, this is, there are pregnant women walking through. Mm -hmm. And um, I, um, 
went, I, I agreed to come to the retreat on the 23rd. I know we talked about a week before that. It was a very long conversation. I remember exactly where I was sitting. It was really the first time, I think we talked for hours, that I told kind of what had led me to that point. And she um, said that, you know, I would be, I think, the 10th that week. I was the final, you know, the final one. And that she said, when you get here, keep coming. When you turn into the to the driveway, keep coming up. And she said, um, you know, because often people get to that point and they, they just, they're scared. And so I arranged to leave work early uh, on a Friday and, and to come in September in the middle of this new job and not knowing what, what I was doing or why I was there and really not feeling any focus other than I needed to do this. Finally, I just needed to do this. And uh, when I came to Rachel's Vineyard uh, that weekend and I came up the driveway and I was, uh, you know, kind of what I'm feeling now, you know, you're just like, oh gosh, now it's real, right? It's getting real. I'm gonna tell this story, which is going to put words and validity to what I did. And I think, you know, I had been to confession before about it um, to priests and I just never felt forgiven, never felt, like there was really any validity. It was still like I was somebody else's life. It was somebody else's life, not the you, life I intended. You were disconnected. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got out of my car and as I'm walking in, there were some lovely ladies there to greet you and hug you and, and thank you for coming. And I thought, well, that's that's kind of strange. You know, I'm a sinner and they're thanking me for coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and came in, checked in. And as soon as I got into my room, there was this beautiful quilt laying there and a letter from a, a, a former retreatant, I believe, and some other items uh, that were just carefully chosen, obviously. And I just unloaded, like I, I was sobbing and sobbing and I didn't even, I'm like, why are you doing it? Like you haven't even started yet, why? <laughs> it, it was like a release. The um, cork was off the, the cork bottle. was off. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and just, you know, as, as, as we moved through that weekend, I was intent on not participating. I was, I'm very quiet, honest, I'm very quiet. I don't like attention on me. And um, it, it just, uh, each one of the exercises throughout the weekend, I can see why it was designed that way because um, particularly the, the Mary Magdalene, um, the Lazarus um, exercise, that was particularly powerful for me. And, um, you know, later on that night when we started opening up, I, I think I only told a partial story uh, and I only got through one before I just kind of stopped and really, I was exhausted emotionally. It was a really emotionally exhausting weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and I took the biggest stone. I, I was determined I, I've got the biggest load here, right? This is, <laughs> I went and took the biggest stone intent upon carrying that. But as that weekend unfolded, every everybody that touched me, it was definitely driven by God. And anybody who had an interaction with me, it was, it was meant to happen that way. Um, from the woman who cooked for us that weekend, but caught me out near uh, the statue and the you know in the yard, and we had a conversation about what I would have named my, you know, my child. Um, and 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 I said, yeah, it, you know, I wanted to name her Madison. This was strange. And I said, but my brother ended up taking that name, so I had to name my my second daughter, you know, you know Abigail. And she said, well, that's because you already had a Madison. And and it's like the light bulb goes on, like, you're right, like, yeah. you're so right. That conversation was just uh, uh, just driven by the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know how, how, to, how else to describe it. Um, well, it went to that place in your heart. Like, yeah. you're, you're right. Yeah. yeah. But never once during that weekend did I feel judged. In fact, when I sat down Friday, when we all formed in our, in our circle, the one word that came out of everybody's mouth was shame. And, and what a powerful tool that was to keep us all injured and our souls hurt. And, and that allowed, and the stories that unfolded, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm not alone. That was the first time in my life I felt like I belonged there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very validating to hear all the stories because yeah. people do feel, because we don't really hear much about abortion trauma. Yeah. We don't really hear it in the news too much. Yeah. So to know that you're not the only one who's suffering and feeling those things can be really affirming. And then you have a support group to move out of it because as you well know, there's so many lies that you play in your head. You mm -hmm. talked about an unconscious need for punishment mm -hmm. and the familiarity, the traumatic reenactment. Yeah. 
Um, and until you've grieved and resolved it, repetition is one of the greatest indicators of trauma. So you had a couple repetitions going on here, yeah. didn't she? With mm -hmm. the repeat pregnancies, repeat abortions, mm -hmm. repeat hooking up with men who did not value the dignity no. of, of your body or the gift of your sexuality. Um, and all those ways just brought you down. But I, I think that was a good point about over-functioning at work to sort of hide and mm -hmm. to make everything look perfect, even though inside the home there was a lot of abuse mm -hmm. going on. Yeah, chaos, and, yeah. And yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of chaos. And that that would just that feels normal to people after a while. A lot of folks wonder, why do you stay in there? Why didn't you just leave after first mm -hmm. first hit or whatever? Why don't why do people stay? Mm -hmm. But it just has to do with um, being in a survivor mode. And you can yeah. probably speak to this well, that in a survivor mode, we lose our judgment, we lose our clarity about mm -hmm. what's even happening, and you're just trying to live through the day and get up the next morning and do it again. And so mm -hmm. people can't really make plans. They, they don't know what their resources are, and they also don't know that they have, that they're worthy of being protected. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when, when the partying lifestyle no longer worked for me, and I met this man who could still work for me in that self-punishment, that felt comfortable to me. It's, fa it's yeah. so familiar. Yeah. You don't even realize, no. you don't even realize what normal would be. No, I, to this day, I probably wouldn't. I, you know, my teenage pregnant, and, and I have a really good relationship with my first husband, the father of my two older daughters, a very, very kind man, uh, never treated me poorly in any way. And, but yet I sought that out. I sought that and brought that into our relationship and then, you know, continued to leave and come back and leave and come back. Um, and then that second time when I went back, you know, and then ultimately got pregnant with my second daughter, he even knew, he knew about the termination, never said a word about it. The Alternatively, in this relationship, it was something, that relationship, the second marriage was more verbal, emotional, mental abuse than it was um, physical. It did certainly get physical at times, but, um, and then I participated. I felt like I, you know, that, that was who we were. That's what drove our passion for each other. It took me a very long time to realize just how toxic that was and, and toxic to our children as well. You know, I, I didn't want to be that person, but I was still allowing myself to be punished while trying to be a good mom. Mm -hmm. Or being a good mom. That's a juggling act. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And and this and and I think when it really started to become evident to me is when my daughter, our daughter, his daughter and my started to get older and she's you know, you want her to have a good and healthy relationship and to be treated right. And I think I saw her choices and boyfriends going down a very similar path. And it concerned me. I think that was really maybe where that awakening started. And then, you know, with my son, the way he was being treated and um, just really, I think it was the catalyst, I would say, to change was really in my two, my two youngest children who were still with me at the time. Mm -hmm. So you, I, I understand you had an extraordinary experience on the retreat um, that I think the viewers would probably love to hear about. I haven't heard it from you but I'm curious okay. as to where you really felt God just reached down. And I know this happens for everybody on the retreat, that there's one yeah. moment where this, the heavens open yeah. and, and grace pours in and you know what you know what you know yeah. and you feel what you feel. That's good to hear because um, I didn't quite believe it had happened. And, you know, those voices that have doubt. And the next day I didn't even talk about it. And I think it took me a while to even talk to Evelyn about it. Uh, because she, those voices are like, did it? Did that really? Yeah, that really happened. And, but yes, I am. Um, you know, you sign up for adoration during Rachel's Vineyard. It's a very important part of the healing process. And I had signed up for my hour at two a.m. on, I guess it would be Saturday morning. Or Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah Sunday morning. Because yeah. um, I thought, well, that's not too late. It's not too, you know. Um, so I go and I, I'm prepared to do my prayers. I do my adoration. I'm praying the whole time, and my mind is busy, and I'm. I put my rock down. I had just been through a fat, just a really healing confession with the priest that was there. I was in there with him over an hour, and I just thought I had to have been the longest confession <laughs> ever. But I had years worth of stuff to talk about, and he was great, and he was so. Fa and I never felt judged. Uh, we went into a lot of lot of stuff. So I go do my adoration from two to three, and I'm busy the whole time praying, doing the rosary, 
and uh, at three o'clock the person who was to relieve me didn't come in and it was 305 and th well there was a sign on the door that had all of our room numbers and our time so I just kind of backed myself out and apologized to the Lord I had to leave for just a second <laughs> and I went down the hall and I knocked on her door a couple of times and nothing I thought okay you're in it you're just in it so I went back and I sat and I want to think it was, it was around 3.20. I was sitting there just quiet because I didn't have anything planned for a second hour. And I, my mind was quiet and the Holy Eucharist and the monstrance just started illuminating. And I blinked my eyes because I thought, wow, you're just tired. It's, it's just your eyes are playing tricks on you. And no, it wasn't. And the, um, it just continued to illuminate until it came out and took the form of our Lord. And then his hands went like this. And on either hand, there was a little illumination that looked like a child. And it was in that moment that I, I knew my children were with Jesus. Oh, it's so beautiful. And not only that, but they became in that moment children to me. Right. And even through the exercises we were doing, it was at that moment that was so tangible for me that yes, it, even though sure you, you were convinced that your abortion happened early and it was just a clump of cells and it, nothing had formed yet, you didn't even have a heartbeat or what, whatever the excuses they give you or the lies they tell you, there was you know that moment of conception when God really places your soul and uh, I, I was there with that for, for just very short, very short instance. And just was so, just shocked for the remaining time that I had. I just sat there like, wow, you know. And, and, but in that moment, so many things happened. You talk about living a lifetime in a moment. Mm -hmm. I had been Catholic my whole life. I had confession right on time, Holy Communion right on time, confirmation right on time. But in that moment, I understood somehow the mystery of the Eucharist and that Christ is present there in that room and in that host and that he died for me like I accepted I think it was very Christ it was you. I just accepted that he suffered for me and died for me and that I was worth it I was worth it and uh, all of that kind of like in an instantaneous moment and changed me for it changed me. What a beautiful, powerful story. Yeah. And um, Christ really did present you with your children in that moment. And you yeah. could feel them yeah. and their love, huh? Absolutely. It was, and it was just instantaneous. But, and it's never happened since. Now, that was September. Um, you know, we, Friday, uh, Sunday was the Mass, and we wrote our, read our letters to our children. That was also very healing because for me at that point then... It was validated. Like I was really mm -hmm. talking to a child, and I was really what a grace, what a beautiful yeah. grace. And you know, um, it, the Holy Father John Paul II said that to post-aborted women that your children are living in the Lord, and mm -hmm. that nothing is definitively lost. And he also said that post-aborted women, and I'll add men too, can be the most eloquent defenders of everyone's right to life. Yeah. And here, because the Lord presented. Um, the children to you, you really got a sense of your motherhood yeah. and, and the dignity of your motherhood too. Evelyn, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but I th think it's a very beautiful concept that every time you go to Eucharist, because you said I had a profound understanding of the Eucharist, that those children are in union with Him, in union and communion. Yeah. And so when you receive Holy Communion, that your children are there with the Lord. Yeah. Well, the way I understand is that, um I don't remember which saint said this, but you know, someone had a vision that the whole altar is full of saints and those who have gone before us. Angels are there uh, mm -hmm. coming up and down at that moment, you know. And and it, what you had was that personal relationship with Jesus that many Christians talk about, mm -hmm. but that was so tangible for you mm -hmm. and beautiful. Yeah. I, I wish more of us who are Roman Catholic could actually speak yeah. of that that's yeah. yeah that's incredible yeah it, it was um it was life-changing and i remember after the mass and after the, the retreat ended and of course everybody's exchanging information and um driving back home from the turnpike i had such a sense of peace i thought i could die right now 
I could, I could, and just I would be with God. In, in a good way. In a good meaning, way, yes. yes. <laughs> meaning, I You're not just, looking for the tractor. No, 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 I'm not looking for it. No, but I was just like, it, it would just, I feel so at peace. I felt like, I felt 100 pounds lighter. I just, and I get back home and I, um, you know, I share that eventually uh, over the next few days with my then husband. Um, and I didn't share a whole lot else. You know, I just, it was very private. Um, but then he started going through my things and asking me questions about the retreat, trying to mm. depersonalize it. Mm. Um, I also started saying the rosary. I, I downloaded a rosary app uh, into my music, and it was the the luminous um, mysteries. And the fourth one, of course, is about transfiguration, mm. and that's become my mine. Like it's, it's <laughs> I when I when I recite that, I can relate to that that light that you see uh, and you then transformed. yeah yeah and then um, a few weeks later my daughter gave birth to my second granddaughter uh, and then or actually a week later from the retreat and um, and then a few days later she suffered a stroke uh, and I ended up just getting very busy after that and I kind of put that all away while still trying to um, I honor what had happened to me saying the rosary and there was one point I remember I'm driving I had a, quite a commute to work in the mornings and I'm drive and driving and s reciting the rosary and all of a sudden I forgot how to say the Hail Mary and it and I, I remember saying you're not doing this to me you're not going to stop me from mm -hmm. praying and I remember feeling a presence I didn't like mm -hmm. and I just started really mm -hmm. loud saying this this Hail Mary and, and it came back to me and then I was able to finish but um, so that was pretty profound and then um, you know the abuse continued and, and in November uh, I remember I was scheduled to go file for a divorce on a Friday and that Monday I remember sitting on the edge of my bed and I was questioning whether or not I was going to go through with it and I looked up to my left, right into the face of our Lord, right into his face. And it was there, and then it was gone. And it was the kindest, most loving face. And I've only ever seen it one other time, and that was one other time uh, about a year later when I, I was, I think he prevented me from being in a car accident. I saw his face and I stopped and a car actually went through um, a stop sign just before I was going to be there. But yeah. um, when I looked up into the face of our Lord, I knew, you know, you have to do this. It, it doesn't feel right, but you, it doesn't feel natural, but you have to do this. So it was. He has a plan for your life. Yeah. And you're here today. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Sharing. But it hasn't been easy. It's, it's, and I'm still a work in progress. You know, it doesn't go away. That's <laughs> that kind of drama, trauma. And um, just, you know, 20 years, you know, 20, 20 to 30 years later, it's still present. And you work on it. But that was, that was my starting point. That was my changing point. And I think God knew I needed that, that experience. Extra grace extra for grace. the extra pain that you had carried for so long that yes. had mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of become part of you. Yeah. And um, I think it does take... A lot of grace to not only turn around, but then to keep living in the truth when there is so many threats against the truth that mm -hmm. want to undermine, destroy, yeah. um, because evil one is the father of lies and deception, and it's Jesus mm -hmm. who came to give us life. And yeah. so that you would have it to the full. And mm -hmm. I believe you're heading in that direction yeah, every absolutely. day. And it's, it's such a joy to have you here today. Um, even though it's painful, there's such a great hope and for anybody out there who suffered the loss of a child from abortion, please mm -hmm. connect with Rachel's Vineyard. The retreats are all over the world, um, and they're a beautiful experience to have that touch of God's mercy through the exercises and through the gift of your child. The child is a gift because um, they're interceding for you. They love you. They long mm -hmm. to be reunited with you, as most mothers' hearts do. But just take some step to recognize, like you said, mm -hmm the motherhood, but in that is restoring the dignity, mm. not only of your motherhood, but of a soul that was created to love and be loved. And when those things mm. aren't happening, and there's a lot of shame, and there's a lot of other drama, abuse, um, coercion, all those things, God loves you, and He invites you for healing, whatever way that may be, but certainly here at the Shrine and throughout the world, there's many mm -hmm. Rachel's Vineyard retreats run by women and men who've suffered the loss of their children, waiting to greet you and take you on the journey closer to Him. 
And do you want to mention Grief to Grace as well? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. another retreat called Grief to Grace, Healing the Wounds of Abuse and Restoring the Gift of, of dignity, Human Dignity. So that's a week-long program. Uses It's a different program, but it uses similar exercises f- that are called Living Scriptures. They're meditations. And we journey through um, the passion of Christ with your own experiences of betrayal, abandonment, um, where was God, that question that anybody asks when they're going through traumatic experiences. And this this retreat really brings forward a beautiful process for grieving the damage and then uniting your pain and suffering to the the grace of the passion as we we go through an entire week. It's a very powerful retreat. I invite you to look that up on Mm grieftograce.org. And then rachelsvineyard.org for our um, post-abortive healing retreats as well. Well, thank you, Julianne. Thank Thank you, you. Teresa. Uh, Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being with us. And thank you all for being with us today.